Welcome to the 2024 Lake Ponderé State of the Lake meeting. My name is Andy Ducks. I'm the regional fishery manager in the Panhandle, and I've been directly involved in management of the Lake Ponderé fishery since 2008. The State of the Lake meeting has a long history. This is a public meeting that Idaho Fishing Game has held since 2005. The meeting is now conducted in a hybrid format. We held an in-person meeting on April 4th and recorded this presentation so that folks who could not attend are still able to receive the information. The purpose of the meeting is to share information about the Lake Ponderé fishery. With it being such a high profile fishery, we've found value in an annual public meeting to interact with anglers. If you are watching this recording, you missed the question and answer component to the meeting. However, please feel free to reach out to our staff with any questions and we'll be happy to visit with you. We're going to provide a presentation similar to past years, as you'll see from the topics listed here. If you haven't participated before, you'll see that this is a lengthy presentation with a lot of detailed information about the fishery. A consistent theme over the years has been folks telling us how much they appreciate the level of detail we include in the presentation. Some of the background information will be a bit repetitive from past years, but that's still important to include for folks who are participating for the first time. There will also be a lot of new information. I'd like to acknowledge and familiarize you with the Idaho Fish and Game Fisheries staff who work on Lake Ponderé. Here I've listed our permanent employees who spend all or a large portion of their time working on Lake Ponderé. Collectively, we have a tremendous team of dedicated fisheries professionals and their work supports the management of this fishery. The LPO fishery is the most intensively managed resident fishery in Idaho and one of the most intensively managed inland fisheries in the country. We are very fortunate to have the resources it requires to manage the fishery at the level we do. The types of programs we implement generally aren't possible on other waters. It's not an accident that Lake Ponderé has regained its notoriety as a world-class trophy fishery and sustained that reputation over the past decade. As we continue through the presentation, I hope you'll see the benefits from the programs we have in place and ultimately the quality and diversity of fishing opportunity this allows us to provide for anglers. The work we do is made possible by funding and collaboration with other agencies and the public. I'd like to acknowledge Avista and the Bonneville Power Administration for funding they provide through hydropower mitigation programs. Most of the work we do on Lake Ponderé is funded through these two mitigation programs. We also have tremendous support from other agencies, contractors, and cooperators that allow us to implement our programs. And we certainly value the support from anglers and other members of the public for our programs. The current Lake Ponderé fishery is diverse and offers good angling opportunity for a variety of species. During our recently completed creel survey, anglers reported catching 19 different fish species. Five were native species and 14 were non-native. Additionally, eight of the species caught are predators that regularly consume kokanee, often along with other fish species. As you can imagine, that means sustaining the fishery relies heavily on managing abundance of these predator populations. Anglers have spent about 200,000 hours annually fishing Lake Ponderé in recent years, so it's a fishery that generates a lot of effort. Over the past 70 plus years of conducting creel surveys on the lake, rainbow trout and kokanee have always generated most of the angler effort. However, the fisheries become more diverse over time and allowed angler effort to increase some for other species. The lake's fishery is not only important locally, but it's a destination fishery that attracts anglers from throughout the region and even other par parts of the country. As a result, it's both socially and economically valuable. Historically, Lake Ponderé supported three native sport fish species, bull trout, west slope cutthroat trout, and mountain whitefish. Since the 1930s, the lake has supported what we refer to as the traditional Lake Ponderé fishery. This is made up of the native bull trout and west slope cutthroat trout, and I will mention that bull trout are listed under the Endangered Species Act as threatened, but Lake Ponderé has the notoriety of being one of the strongest migratory bull trout populations anywhere in the country. In the 1930s, non-native kokanee were established in the lake, and they've provided a dual role. They provide a very popular recreational harvest fishery, which for many years supported the most popular harvest fishery in Idaho. And they also provide the primary prey source for a number of predators in the lake, particularly bull trout and Girard strain rainbow trout that were introduced in 1941. These are also known as Kamloops by many anglers. 
This is a strain of rainbow that's native to Kootenai Lake, British Columbia, and co-evolved with kokanee. When an abundant kokanee food supply is present, these fish can reach tremendous sizes. In the 1940s, Lake, Pond Lake Pondere became known as a world-class trophy fishery. Two world record fish were caught in that era. The former world record rainbow at 37 pounds was caught in 1947. And in 1949, what's still the world record bull trout at 32 pounds was caught in the lake. These fish got to the sizes they did because of an abundant kokanee food supply. And we've found that since that time, whenever we can sustain high densities of kokanee, we can provide incredible trophy fishing opportunity in Lake Pondere. The traditional Lake Pondere fishery performed at a high level for many years, but eventually factors emerged that led to some declines in the fishery. Bull trout and West Slope cutthroat trout suffered from tributary habitat loss and degradation and negative interactions with introduced species. Kokanee had some population declines, particularly starting in the late 1960s, resulting from spawning habitat loss, hydropower operations, and negative interactions with introduced species. Despite some declines, the population was generally sustained at a reasonably high level and still supported good fishing opportunity. This changed beginning in the late 1990s when kokanee began to rapidly decline and by the 2000s were at risk of complete collapse because of high predation following a rapid increase in the lake trout population. As a result of fewer kokanee, the trophy rainbow trout and bull trout fisheries suffered. The severe decline of the kokanee population in the late 90s and early 2000s prompted us to focus our management efforts on recovery of the traditional Lake Pondere fishery. With broad public support from anglers, we established recovery goals and a recovery program that really had two key components. We wanted to bring back the recreational sport fishing opportunity that was in jeopardy, specifically providing a consistent harvest fishery for kokanee and also having an abundant enough kokanee population to fuel fast growth rates that would offer trophy fishing opportunity for rainbow trout and bull trout. In addition, we had native species conservation goals, specifically for bull trout and cutthroat trout, which were jeopardized by the increasing presence of lake trout in the system. Fortunately, our recovery efforts have been successful and the Lake Pondere fishery is now fishing at one of the highest levels it has in decades. In fact, we've moved out of a recovery phase and now are focused on sustaining the fishery at a high level. Recovery of the Lake Pondere fishery has generally been viewed as one of the greatest fisheries conservation success stories in the Western US. We're quite proud of that and it's been really gratifying to see the resurgence of the fishery, especially because it required a lot of patience on the part of anglers as we rebuilt the fishery. But it's now performing at an incredible level and like I said, trying to sustain that fishery is now our focus. Since recovery efforts, not only has the traditional fishery improved, but there's now expanded fishing opportunity for a variety of non-native species that have become established. Our challenge is trying to determine how to manage this suite of non-native species, determining what species we can manage for and which species we have to manage against in order to sustain the fishery over the long term. A number of non-native species like kokanee and rainbow trout have been part of the fishery for decades and have demonstrated an ability to coexist with native species, provide added angling opportunity, and be sustainable over time. The good news is most of the non-native species that have become established are largely compatible with our fishery management goals, such as smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, panfish, brown trout, lake whitefish, and they've added recreational value to the fishery. Unfortunately, there are three species that have proven to be a bigger threat to, the, to sustaining the traditional fishery, and those include lake trout, walleye, and northern pike, and we have to manage against these species. To provide a little bit more background into how we make these decisions, we're now going to show a video that we rec recently produced to try to help provide a little bit more background on our management approach. Lake Pondere. 
At nearly 1,200 feet deep and 90,000 surface acres, it's home to a host of popular fisheries. Awesome. Bull trout, West Slope cutthroat trout, and mountain whitefish are native to the lake. Lake trout were introduced in 1925. Kokanee arrived in the 1930s, and Girard rainbow trout were introduced in 1941. Bass made their first appearance in the 1990s. And now, walleye and northern pike are the newest fish to become established in Lake Pend Oreille. As each new fish species arrived in the lake, anglers discovered new fishing opportunities. The Lake Pondre fishery is constantly changing. Our challenge is to try to adjust our management as those changes occur and try to provide a balance out here so that we're meeting our fishery objectives and providing the fishing opportunity that the public wants. The question is, how do you manage a growing number of predatory fish species and provide for the continued survival of their primary prey? Kokanee. So kokanee are really the foundation of today's Lake Pondere fishery. There are seven different predators in the lake that rely on kokanee for at least a part of their diet, some more than others, but that predation pressure on kokanee forces us to really pick and choose which species that we can manage for and which we need to manage against so that that kokanee food supply can support predation, recreational angling, and be sustainable into the future. Three fish in particular, lake trout, walleye, and northern pike, pushed managers to make tough decisions. These fish not only put additional pressure on kokanee, they also proved to be incompatible with the survival of other fish species. A thriving lake trout population seriously threatened kokanee survival in the 1990s and early 2000s. Lake trout have been part of the fishery for decades, but they existed at very low abundance until the late 1990s after mysis shrimp allowed their population to really expand. So with an abundant mysis food supply, juvenile lake trout survival increased, the lake trout population rapidly expanded, and with the additional predation from lake trout on kokanee, it led to the collapse of the kokanee population. Collapse of the kokanee threatened the entire Lake Pondere fishery. To save it, Fish and Game called on anglers and a commercial fishing operation to harvest lake trout. Fewer lake trout allowed the kokanee population to recover. But then, two more top-tier predatory fish arrived. Walleye and northern pike have become part of the equation in Lake Ponderay. Both resulted from illegal introductions upstream in Montana. Every time we add predation from a new species, it makes it more challenging to support the kokanee population. In addition, we have concerns about walleye having predation impacts on other fish that we're managing for, such as rainbow trout, bull trout, west slope cutthroat trout. Experience of other western waters demonstrates that if walleye and northern pike populations are allowed to grow unchecked, they become a threat to numerous fish species in a lake. Walleye are very diverse in their diet, and so they will be opportunistic and take advantage of a lot of different species, and in particular, cold water fish such as rainbow trout, bull trout, west slope cutthroat trout. That's what we're trying to remove. To sustain Lake Ponderay's fishery, fish managers actively control these new predator populations. Anglers are part of this effort. An important thing for anglers to understand is although we manage against lake trout, walleye, and northern pike, we're just trying to manage them at low density, not eliminate them completely in the, from the lake. That's an exceptionally difficult thing to do and frankly just not realistic. There will continue to be angling opportunity for those three species in the lake under our current management. And we rely on anglers to be part of the equation to keep those fish at low densities. For fish managers, the end game is to create a balance in Lake Ponderé one that maintains a diverse and compatible fishery while meeting the needs of the fishing public. It would be great to have it all, and be able to manage for every species that gets established in the lake, but that just isn't reality and the, the biology doesn't allow for it. 
you can only support a certain biomass of fish in a particular water body. All these fish interact differently with one another. And so we have to make some hard choices at times and understand which species we can continue to provide long-term angling opportunity for without threatening the sustainability of the fishery. I think you can see that Lake Pend Oreille is an incredibly dynamic fishery. We have a lot of challenges, particularly with the increasing number of species that become established in the lake. There are a lot of moving parts and pieces, and our challenge is how to adaptively manage the fishery in response to the changes that are occurring. Here I've shown some of the most common tools we have in the toolbox to manage the fishery. Throughout the presentation, I think you'll see how we use many of these tools. And in particular, I wanna focus on a couple of the tools, lake trout suppression and walleye suppression, that get a lot of attention and I think provide a, a, warrant a little bit more background. We have a long history of lake trout suppression in Lake Pend Oreille. We started this program back in 2006 and this really was the driving factor behind recovery of the kokanee population and the trophy fishery. To do this work we've contracted with a commercial fishing company Hickey Brothers Research that brought the ability to operate large-scale fishing gear and experience netting lake trout in the Great Lakes region. We work hand-in-hand -hand with our staff on the boat to remove lake trout using this netting approach. In addition, we've enlisted the help of anglers through what we call the Angler Incentive Program, where we pay anglers $15 for every lake trout that they remove from Lake Pend Oreille. This work has been coupled with research and monitoring so that we can understand how to be most efficient with our netting efforts avoid non-target species, and monitor the response that we're seeing not only in the lake trout population, but in the species that we're seeking to benefit. Our walleye suppression program has a much shorter history. We began a netting program in 2018 in response to a growing walleye population, and this is much smaller in scale. It's conducted in the spring during April and early May over a 15 day period. We do it at this time of year to focus on walleye that are aggregating in the pre-spawn and spawning window, and we've used telemetry to identify areas where we could be most efficient with that netting. Net sets are set over a short duration to minimize mortality to other species. And then just like with lake trout, fish are distributed within the community to food banks. Also, like we have with lake trout, there's an angler incentive program that we started in 2019 so that anglers can help be part of the solution. It's structured a little bit differently. We tag roughly about 100 fish that are in the lake in a given year that have $1,000 reward tags. The tags aren't known when an angler catches the fish, but if you turn in the heads, we scan the fish, and if it has one of these high dollar tags, you'll be given the, the reward. In addition, we have monthly drawings for $100 rewards. We give out 10 of those per month. So even if you turn in a wallet that doesn't have one of the $1,000 tags, you still have a chance to win money. I want to provide a little bit more background on the difference in scale between the lake trout and walleye suppression programs. This map shows all of our netting locations in a typical year. The blue dots represent locations where we set nets for lake trout. The orange dots represent where we set nets for walleye. So you'll quickly see that lake trout netting occurs throughout much of the lake and in far more locations. And that's a result of having a netting program that occurs over many months of the year. Walleye netting only occurs over a 15 day period. Most nets are set in and around the mouth of the Pack River Delta, although there are some nets set elsewhere on the north end of the lake. But in general, the total netting effort we expend in a given year is about 90% targeting lake trout and only about 10% targeting walleye. So I think it's just important to understand the difference in scale in these two efforts. And I also wanna provide a little bit more background on the effects our netting has on other fish species. We get a lot of questions about this, and so we've recently produced a video that hopefully will help you better visualize what occurs out on the netting boats and what happens with fish that are caught in the nets. So we're gonna play that video next. It's a clear spring morning on Lake Pend Oreille and an Idaho fishing game gill netting crew is off to a good start. We are 
getting ready to pull gill nets that were set early this morning um, with the intention of catching and removing walleye. For three weeks, the crew targets walleye. Other times of the year, they target lake trout. Gill netting, along with angler incentive programs, is being used to control these fish populations. These two apex predators are incompatible with the lake's fishery. They put additional pressure on kokanee and compete with other fish species, which in turn threatens the long-term health of the lake-wide fishery. And we're concerned that if left unchecked, walleye and lake trout could cause a decline in the kokanee population. And as a result of that, we're trying to be aggressive and keep that population from reaching a high density. Fish managers use gill nets for a range of activities from sampling and monitoring fish populations to catching and removing fish. But some anglers are concerned the nets catch too many non-target fish in the process. There's a common perception that any fish that encounters a gill net dies, and frankly that's a misconception. We can use gill nets in a way that minimize the likelihood of catching non-target species and maximize the survival rate of fish that encounter the nets. To avoid catching other fish species, managers have refined when, where, and how to set their nets in the lake. For example, we do a lot of telemetry work to identify where lake trout or walleye are most easily targeted and when they have the least overlap with other species. We can set nets for short durations, so commonly we'll set nets in the morning and just let them fish for several hours and then check those nets, as opposed to having them fish all day or overnight. So fish are in the nets for a shorter period of time and have higher survival. We also use different mesh sizes that most commonly will target, in this case, often walleye or lake trout most effectively while minimizing the bycatch of other species. Even with preventative measures in place, other species still get caught. Crews are prepared when this happens. When we're bringing gill nets onto the boat, we do our best to focus on the species that we're trying to release alive. These fish are untangled and processed first. They are weighed and measured. Some have genetic samples taken. Many get tags as part of a recapture or angler incentive program. Then they go into the recovery tank. We have recovery tanks on board the boat. Oftentimes we'll even put ice in those tanks to make sure the water's nice and cold or even have dissolved oxygen added to the water to, to supplement oxygen levels and help these fish uh, just have a little bit of time to recover before we release them back into the lake. These are the fish Lake Ponderay is famous for. This is the fishery we're trying to protect along with native fish. There she goes. Data collected from the TAG programs verify that the steps taken to protect non-targeted fish are working. The fish that we tag for the angler incentive program are typically caught in gill nets. We then tag those fish and they're later caught by anglers. So those things point toward the fact that um, when we release fish off the boat, they commonly do very well. Here's another one of those double tagged fish. Take a few breaths and off they go. One of the things that's been interesting over the years is when we have folks out on the boat who maybe aren't familiar with our operations and they see it for the first time, they're generally amazed at how good a shape most of the fish are that come in the boat and how much effort we put into keeping the non-target fish alive and, and making sure they're released in good shape. Those fish that are caught and removed do not go to waste. We do our very best to get as many of those fish to local food banks as possible so that those fish aren't wasted and they can be used by folks in the community. Recently, the program donated more than 15,000 pounds of fish to local food banks. The Lake Ponderay fishery has recovered over the past decade largely because of the predator suppression program. It would not have been possible to recover the fishery without the use of gill nets as a management tool and their use will be important for sustaining the fishery into the future. Hi, my name is Ryan Hardy. I'm the Principal Fishery Research Biologist on the Lake Ponderay Fishery Research Program. My section covers the latest in species status updates and fishery science on Lake Ponderay. 
The way I've structured this presentation is to first cover the important fisheries we are managing for in the lake, and then also touch on the status of species that pose potential risks to those fisheries. So I'll start with the kokanee update, because kokanee are the cornerstone of the Lake Ponderé fishery, and they really are the number one reason why Ponderé is well known for growing such large fish species. To start with, I want to show everyone a look at the total abundance of kokanee older than fry over the last few years. Our surveys show that we continue to see exceptionally high levels of kokanee abundance through 2023, and we are sustaining a strong enough population to support the growth of predator fish species and kokanee fishery as well. We did, however, see that the average size of adult kokanee was quite a bit smaller last year at a little over eight inches in our trawl sampling. And so we understand and recognize that it really made for some tough fishing for anglers, especially during the early part of the summer. This is the kind of thing that we're paying attention to due to the recent uptick in mysis shrimp and the role they play in competing with kokanee for food, which I'll talk about a bit later. What we can tell you is that the data show that there are good numbers of younger year classes filling in. We also see that in the estimate of total fry abundance. To orient you with this figure, the dashed line is the average fry abundance through 2023. As you can see, the fry abundance this past year is again above the average from the last 20 years. And although it can be difficult to fully predict adult abundance based on fry abundance alone, we have confidence that there is enough kokanee reproduction sufficient to fully seed the lake in the coming years. Another way we evaluate kokanee is by evaluating the total biomass, which is essentially the total weight of all kokanee in the lake. And again, this directly influences how much food is available for kokanee predators. Starting in the mid 1990s and for a little more than a decade, biomass was on a concerning downward trend. Through our research program, we determined that the primary reason for this was that predation of kokanee exceeded the new biomass produced each year, and that was a recipe for fishery collapse. In 2006, we began removing predators, and kokanee biomass started to respond immediately. But in 2011 and 2012, another major shift occurred in the system when the mysis shrimp population collapsed. Although we don't know the reason for the collapse, this was a phenomenon that has been observed to a greater or lesser degree elsewhere in the region. Mysis shrimp are a small freshwater shrimp and were introduced into the lake in the late 1960s with strong public support in hopes that they would be an abundant food source for kokanee. Unfortunately, this was not the case and they wound up as a great food source for juvenile lake trout and competed with kokanee for zooplankton. But after mycids collapsed, we saw kokanee biomass rebound to a level that hasn't been observed in decades. This new era of kokanee production is a very good thing for growth of all species that consume kokanee. We pay close attention to these trends because although kokanee exhibit natural fluctuations in their populations, these fluctuations can also potentially reveal changes in competition and predation. Now I'll switch over and talk about one of those species that benefits from an abundant kokanee population, and that is rainbow trout. We are actively involved in evaluating the rainbow trout fishery. Directly measuring rainbow trout abundance is very difficult because these fish occupy offshore habitat and they spawn at or near runoff. But with the help of anglers, we can monitor growth and catch statistics of these fish as an opportunity to keep our finger on the pulse of their performance. So a few years ago, we started the Lake Ponderay Angler Science Program to do just that. This is where we work with a group of anglers to complete angler logbooks and work with a few select anglers to assist us with floy and acoustic tagging, as well as get aging structures to evaluate growth. And this has really built a great relationship with the Lake Ponderay anglers and provided us with very valuable data. So the value of this program cannot be overstated. Here's an example of angler data over the past eight years. We see that logbook data show increased catch rates and increased sizes, showing that the fishery is continuing to perform at a high level. The three fall derbies of 2023 all had winning fish above 20 pounds, so some tremendous growth continuing to occur in the lake. And we expect to see this continue in 2024 as well. 
To show the type of rainbow trout growth we are seeing, here is a length weight relationship figure from angler caught fish in 2023. The x axis represents total length in inches, and the y axis on the left is weight in pounds. This is showing that fantastic growth I was referring to, and that if you catch a fish that is between 35 and 39 inches, you're getting close to that 25 pound mark, just showing the phenomenal growth potential in the lake. Another way we gauge the performance of the fishery is by the return of visible external floy tags that are periodically put out in a portion of fish. Our staff, along with the assistance of some anglers, have been floy tagging rainbows over the past couple of years. The return of these tags by anglers that recapture these fish helps us determine things like harvest and fishery participation. Tags can be clipped off or you can write down the tag number or take a photo of it and then release the fish with the tag still in it. If you catch a fish with a reward tag, the dollar amount will be listed on the tag. These tags must be removed from the fish and mailed into the Idaho Fishing Game to claim the reward, whether anglers harvest the fish or not. Over the past few years, we put out over a thousand of these Floyd tags. With the return of these tags, we estimated that the proportion of the population that was caught was around 19%. Another way to think about it is that 81% of the fish in the population are not caught in a given year. When we look at exploitation, which is the proportion of the population that is estimated to have been harvested in a given year, it was only 9%. From a management perspective, this tells us that most of the rainbows do not get caught in a given year and harvest is relatively low. Based on these results, we can be comfortable that over harvest is not occurring. In addition to Floyd tagging, we're also using acoustic telemetry to answer some questions about rainbows in the basin. The acoustic tags will allow us to estimate things like where and when most rainbows spawn, the total number of spawns for an individual, and causes of mortality. As I mentioned, it is difficult to get our hands on these pelagic fish, and so we're fortunate to have a good relationship with many of our rainbow anglers on the lake. Just a couple of months back, we worked with 15 key anglers to help catch and provide us with those tackable fish. To show you how this worked, when an angler got a fish, they radioed our boat to come over and they stayed under power as we pulled in front of the boat and matched their speed. This way, they didn't have to pull in all of their multiple trolling rods to give us a fish. We then sent back an empty cooler that the fishermen pulled in, filled a quarter full with water, and put their fish in it. We then pulled it back into our boat, pulled away, and did the tagging surgeries. This method worked really slick, and we're looking forward to doing it again the next few years of this study. Now I will shift and talk just a minute about bull trout. Although they are listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act, Lake Ponderé supports one of the strongest populations of bull trout in the country. While we don't currently allow a harvest opportunity for bull trout in the system, they do add diversity to our fishery in the form of an outstanding catch and release fishery for a native fish that reaches trophy sizes. In fact, in 2020, the state catch and release record of 39 inches was caught and unofficially weighed 31 pounds, which is just shy of the current world record bull trout caught in the lake in 1949. As with rainbow trout, these fish can reach tremendous sizes when there is an abundant kokanee food supply. We have also been working on evaluating the effects of the long-term lake trout suppression program on adult bull trout survival rates in Lake Pend Oreille. To do this, we used mark recapture data for tagged bull trout encountered on the net boat from 2011 to 2021. In this time period, we handled around 11,000 bull trout, so we were able to have a good enough sample for this estimate. Although we take measures to reduce bycatch mortality, we do see a small portion of mortality in the nets. But when we looked at the population over the long term, we found that as lake trout abundance has declined, adult bull trout survival in the lake has increased significantly. And this tells us that our lake trout suppression program is indeed having positive effects on bull trout. We also monitor this population using traditional red counts or the number of spawning beds created by adults as an index of abundance shown here by the light bars in this figure. The results over the past 30 years show us that this estimated number of reds is variable on an annual basis 
and also shows a decline over the most recent years. Recognizing the uncertainty of some of these index methods, we have developed an abundance model that uses red numbers, in lake survival, and juvenile densities in the tributaries. Currently, the combination of these index methods show that the number of bull trout in the basin are robust and stable. Okay, now that we've covered the main fisheries updates, I will transition to our evaluation and monitoring of some of the risks to the sustainability of those fisheries, namely lake trout, walleye, northern pike, and mysis shrimp. We'll start with lake trout. We now have a long history of suppressing this species, and that management has paid dividends in terms of the quality of the fishing in Lake Ponderé. Early modeling efforts identified that our adult abundance target needed to be lower than where it was at in the 1990s, which was around 2,500 adults, to avoid negative fishery impacts. As a result of our lake trout suppression efforts, we have removed around 270,000 lake trout to date. And we are seeing this translate into a steady decrease in adult abundance in the lake. This figure shows the trend in estimated abundance of spawning age lake trout in Lake Ponderay through 2023. The abundance of adult lake trout peaked in 2005, and because of the netting efforts, we've seen a greater than 85% decline in abundance of adults since then. This gives us good confidence that we are on track to reaching our goal. Once we get there, our modeling indicates that we may be able to substantially remove netting effort and still maintain our hold over the population. We will be cautious about how the reduction in effort occurs to be sure the population responds the way we expect. Moving off of lake trout, I will now spend a bit of time talking about walleye. Walleye have been a big focus of our research in more recent years. And our main concern is the effect that walleye, if left unchecked, will have on our managed fisheries like kokanee. This figure is a result of our fall walleye index netting, or FWIN netting, over time. As you can see, walleye were exponentially increasing in catch rates from 2011 through 2017. We then implemented our 15-day suppression netting in 2018 and incentivized angling in 2019 in hopes of curbing this increase. <clears throat> we then did another FWIN survey in 2020, and the results were encouraging, suggesting that perhaps our suppression actions were working to curb that increase. We recently completed another FWIN survey in October of 2023, and unfortunately, the results showed that our catch rates were back up to where they were in 2017. This wasn't a complete surprise because some early reports from fishermen told us that the fishing was very good and we saw good reports of head returns in the AIP. Taking a closer look at what age classes made up this increase, we saw that the majority were young of year and the rest were mainly age two at a similar number as was found in 2017. Before we consider adjusting netting effort, the next step will be to monitor this cohort and other strong cohorts to determine just how many make it through to our adult suppression nets. Overall, the walleye suppression programs have resulted in the removal of more than 14,000 walleye since 2018. As shown in the figure on the left, catches in spawner netting initially showed a steep reduction in the number per net. However, we're now seeing a slight increase over the past couple of years. But really the big increase is apparent in the angler removals where they tripled the number of heads returned since it began. The majority of these fish were age two, which was similar to what we saw in the, in the FWIN survey in the fall. So we're curious to see if this will translate into high catch rates of three-year-olds in the spawner suppression netting this spring. There are times when we get asked about what other fish get caught in our nets. To show this, here's a figure that displays what's been captured in our walleye netting over the past six years. Here you can see incidental mortality of other species is very low. For example, even though we catch a lot of smallmouth bass, they almost never die in our short set nets because they are hardy and don't get wedged into the gill nets very easily. In fact, most of the mortalities we see in the suppression netting here in orange are a direct result of intentional removal opportunities for lake trout, 
walleye, and northern pike, which are all species we are managing against. We only release these species if we are either trying to get an idea of exploitation by releasing them with floy tags, or to maintain the number of walleye with coated wire tags for the angler incentive program. To highlight last year's performance of the walleye angler incentive program, we saw about 227 anglers participate in 2023, and this has actually remained relatively stable since it began in 2018. We saw 13 coated wire tagged fish returned for $1,000 rewards. The program paid out $12,000 in monthly drawings, and we ended up the season with a total of around $25,000 being paid out to anglers, which is the highest ever being paid out. We continue to release fish with coated wire tags each year to maintain around 75 to 100 fish of all sizes at any one time. Okay, now I wanna switch and talk a bit about some interesting things we have learned about walleye distribution in the basin through our telemetry program. We have an objective to maintain between 30 to 50 walleye implanted with acoustic tags at any one time in order to evaluate all of these movements. Acoustic tag locations are recorded on remote receivers that are distributed throughout the lake as shown here by the circles on the map of the basin. As you can see, we have a fair number of receivers to capture these movements. And although we have a lot of receivers, there are obviously limitations on how specific we can interpret the movements we are detecting because of the coarse nature of the detections that occur. What I would like to show everyone here is an example of how the acoustic program is really unraveling some interesting movement information, which can be very beneficial for increasing not only angler catch rates, but also help us in our suppression efforts as well. For example, here's a map with animations of 26 tagged walleye during the spring of 2023. This gives us an, an idea of their movements during the spawning window, which starts mid-April. Here you can see that these fish made distinct movements into locations centered around the Long Bridge and the Clark Fork River, suggesting that these could be potential spawning areas. Our netting suppression focuses on intercepting these fish at or on the way to these locations. Here's a zoomed in depiction of movements of 36 tagged fish at the same period of time in 2022 at the north end of Pond Array. Because of the shallow habitat, it can be difficult to set nets in some of these areas, and we encourage folks to concentrate in these locations for the best catch rates. Keep in mind that although these fish seem to be moving in a straight and narrow path, this is an artifact of where the receivers are located, and the reality is that the movements are likely much more variable. Once we get into late June, July, and August, these are times when we have the highest head returns by anglers. And at looking at these movements, it seems that the best bet is to concentrate near the Long Bridge and the two bays on the either side of Kootenai Point. And the reported locations of walleye caught in the AIP coincide with this type of activity. With regards to walleye movements in the fall, based on our telemetry in general, the only time we detect walleye using the deep basin of the lake is in the fall and winter when temperatures start to cool. This isn't surprising because it is less optimal habitat for walleye. It also coincides with the concentration of kokanee in the southern end prior to spawning. And we know from recent diet work that when walleye are found here, they are almost exclusively consuming kokanee. Although we see some movements in the deep basin in the fall, this is a relatively low number of fish compared to the concentrations we see, for example, in the Clark Fork River. Looking at this type of activity suggests that a good bet for better catch rates in the fall would be to focus efforts around the lower Clark Fork River. Okay, now I'll move from walleye to talk a bit about northern pike in the Lake Ponderay Basin. Pike were first documented below Cabinet Gorge Dam in the 1970s, which is consistent with the time they became widespread in Montana and other parts of Idaho. For whatever reason, pike remained at a low level and only showed it up incidentally in sampling gear until basically the last decade. And really, it has just been in the last five years that the majority of pike have been showing up in our routine sampling. 
We are concerned about northern pike in the system for a variety of reasons. The biggest is their potential impact on migratory fish from tributaries, as well as their impact on other soft raid native non-game fish that inhabit near shore areas. As you can see here on the map, most pike sampled in our recent netting events are in the north to northeastern part of the lake in the Clark Fork River Delta at depths less than 60 feet deep. The first documented recording of pike being sampled in our gear in the Ponderay River was in 2020 just west of the Long Bridge. As you can see here in this figure, catch rates of our bycatch of pike and our walleye nets has steadily increased over the last few years. We have also seen an increase in pike bycatch in our lake trout suppression netting over time as well. Lake trout nets are generally fished deeper than walleye nets from 60 to 250 feet deep. Pike in Lake Ponderay are growing at a phenomenal rate. This figure here on the left is a growth curve of pike captured in the last few walleye netting efforts. When comparing length and age data of pike in Lake Ponderay versus other North Idaho waters such as Coeur d'Alene and Hayden Lake, the difference in growth of older fish in Ponderay is quite remarkable, where older fish are pushing 40 inches and obviously not having any issues finding prey items. Although Hayden and Coeur d'Alene do see these top-end fish as well, the average is currently higher for Lake Ponderay. And as a side note, the state record pike just recently came out of Hayden Lake, just as a reference of the growth potential for pike in Ponderay. We are finding out that anglers are harvesting a fair number of pike in the system. We recently released about 200 pike with Floyd tags in 2023 and are evaluating the return of those tags. Although it hasn't been quite a full year yet, so far we've seen about 41% harvest and the number of fish that were caught by anglers was around 48%. This suggests that if a pike is being caught in the lake, it has a very high likelihood of being harvested. So similar to walleye, the hope is that angler harvest coupled with our suppression netting for walleye will be enough to keep things from becoming a problem for our managed salmonid fisheries. Okay, now for our final species update, I'll talk a minute about the status of mice's shrimp in the system. Just to recap on some background on mice's, they were introduced into the lake in the 1960s and became well established by 1975. They were introduced into the lake in hopes that they would be an abundant food source for kokanee. Unfortunately, this was not the case and they wound up being a great food source for juvenile lake trout and competed with kokanee for zooplankton. Mycets have the ability, when highly abundant, to limit food availability for kokanee, which in turn has negative ramifications for apex predators in the lake. We keep a close eye on mycets because they have the potential to have an outsized impact on our ability to sustain a high kokanee population. So I'll go ahead and cut right to the chase. Through 2020, mycid abundance was still at a very low density due to their parent crash starting in 2012 in the system, which was a very good thing for kokanee, the growth of predatory fish, and the fishery in general. The 2020 mycid densities were around 40% of the 1995 to 2011 trend, so things were very optimal for kokanee production. Fast forward to the last few years, we are now seeing higher than average densities than previous estimates, and the 2021 sample was actually over double from the average over the past 10 years, and it was the highest since before the population collapsed. This is definitely something that we will be watching closely moving forward. We've been very fortunate to have fewer mycids in the system for nearly a decade, and this has benefited kokanee. We expect that a fairly strong kokanee population can be sustained with more mycids present. However, the lake likely won't be able to support as many kokanee if mycids return to higher densities into the future. This will just give us less margin of error in terms of providing enough kokanee to support predator populations as well as a good kokanee fishery. We are also involved in many other studies to assist with trying to keep this diverse fishery operating at its best. For example, in addition to our annual kokanee surveys that help us determine abundance in biomass, we are also trying to refine our understanding of how 
Zooplankton and mysis shrimp density influence the survival of these fish from one year to the next. We are also evaluating what are the potential factors that limit the mysis shrimp populations because even if we can't control it, there is value in understanding what influences their numbers. For northern pike, we will likely be doing a diet study this next spring with a graduate student to understand the potential impacts these fish are having on our managed salmonid population. Lake Ponderay has an excellent smallmouth bass fishery that is compatible with our salmonid fishery goals. And so understanding how that fishery is operating is part of our research. We are also evaluating the movement of other species such as bull trout, northern pike, and lake trout to answer similar questions to those I discussed with walleye and rainbow. And the hope is that this information will assist us in meeting management objectives and we keep this fishery a diverse angling experience. Hi, my name is Ken Bowens. I'm a mitigation staff biologist with IDF&G. I focus on monitoring the fish populations in the tributaries to Lake Ponderay, performing fish habitat and enhancement work in those tributaries, as well as land conservation and acquisition. Today, I'll provide a few updates on the things we've accomplished recently. Many of the trout populations in Ponderay use the tributaries as spawning and juvenile rearing areas, and we perform standard backpack electrofishing surveys to monitor these populations. I realize we've talked about that a time or two, but we haven't really shown you what the, what the surveys look like and explained them to you. So um, the first thing we do is a section of the stream is identified and the ends of the section are blocked off with a net so fish can't escape. Generally that section is about 100 meters long, but it doesn't have to be exactly that amount. And then we start on one end and work to the other. Um, the person on the right is holding the, electro, the backpack electrofishing unit. Um, it produces a current in the water that stuns the fish. And then the netter, which usually works downstream of the, the electrofisher, uh, catches the fish and places them in a bucket where they quickly recover. Uh, we take one to three passes through the section to ensure that we've caught pretty much all of the fish in the section. Um, we don't have to get them all because we do some fancy math to estimate the total number of fish that we catch by species. So then at that point, the fish are okay. Um, data are taken off the fish that we includes the number of fish that we caught, their length, their weight, and sometimes a few scales um, to figure out the age of the fish. At that point, the fish are released alive. And from all that, we can figure out species composition, density, and growth for each section that we sample. We've been monitoring the fish populations in the tributary, tributaries to LPO for over 15 years now. Uh, we've sampled 96 locations in 25 streams on a five-year rotational basis. The black triangles on the map on the right show the locations of our monitoring sections. Um, as you can see, we, we covered the entire watershed from the Pack River watershed on the north down to uh, the Lightning Creek watershed, um, Mid Lake, and then down to Granite Creek and Gold Creek to the south end of the lake. Uh, this survey was set up as a broad brushed approach to understand how the tributaries are being used in that we sampled the most of the streams that we uh, know support salmonids or trout. We sampled them from top to bottom to understand the longitudinal fish distribution within the stream and production. And we sampled them more than once to see if the uh, occupancy and production changed substantially over the time in that we sampled those streams. So now I'll tell you a bit about what we found. There are a lot of layers to this onion, and we'll talk about the outer couple at this point and peel some back as we go. For the next few slides, uh, the map on the right shows the species general distribution and abundance. So I don't want you to get hung up on the numbers, um, but the take home message is that the larger the dot, the more fish of that species that we found at that location. And if there's an X, we sampled there, but we didn't find any fish. I uh, will start talking about West Slope cutthroat trout. Um, by far, they the, were the most abundant species that we encountered. encountered. Uh, cutthroat are the only major species that we sampled in the tributaries that had adult fish uh, present. Um, that tells us some cutthroat complete their entire life cycles in the streams. Uh, and then you can see in the, in the map above, um, you know, in some places, they can be very abundant, up, especially up above barriers. And that's where, where we had um, these resident populations. Um, and some are migratory. They are spawned in the stream and they rear for one to three years in the tributary and then they finish maturing in the lake. And at that point, after about five years or so, they return to the stream to spawn again. 
Um, as I said, they were found in pretty much all the streams that we sampled, um, and they were really more abundant in the headwaters of the streams um, than down lower in the streams. And there's, um, like I said, also naturally occurring resident populations above the migration barriers that were very abundant. Now we'll talk about bull trout. They were found in the headwaters of the larger streams and were more evenly distributed in streams that entered directly into the lake like Trestle and Granite Creek. We know that they need cold water, so it makes sense that we find them up in the places where the streams are smaller and cooler. Um, all the bull trout that we found appeared to be migratory since all of the fish we caught were juveniles like the one shown at the left. So we don't have any evidence of any uh, resident bull trout populations in the tributaries. Now let's talk rainbows. I'd like to point out that some genetic work we did back in the late 2000s indicated that except for one small population above, above a barrier falls on Hell Roaring Creek, all the rainbows that uh, we sample, we believe in the, in the tributaries, we believe are Gerard strain rainbows. And all of the fish that we caught were juveniles like the one shown on the photo on the left. So if you look at the map again, they were concentrated in the larger systems uh, like Lightning Creek and the Pack River drainages. Um, and I also want to point out that we didn't sample mainstream pack and lightning creeks, but we do know that they're quite abundant lower in these drainage, uh, drainages. So take home message is there are a lot of juvenile rainbows around and it seems like we have a lot of recruitment of those fish. So now I'll peel back the onion skin one more layer to talk about densities. We summarized all the catch data that we collected over the last 15 years from all the samples to provide a 10,000 foot overview of overall production. So this figure shows the average density of fish uh, on the y-axis by species, so bull trout, cutthroat trout, rainbow trout, and cutthroat rainbow hybrids, and round. So the first time we sampled it was in blue, the second time is in orange, and the third is in gray on the x-axis. I also added, uh, as during the entire survey, we caught bull trout in 50 of our 96 sections, cutthroat trout in 82 sections, rainbows in 50 sections, and hybrids in 55 sections. I didn't add it here, but I'll tell you that the number of sections where we sampled an individual species varied a little bit between rounds, but not very much. And averaged over the entire survey, as I previously mentioned, cutthroat were the most abundant, followed by rainbow trout and bull trout, and then hybrids at a low density. So the take home message here is that the overall densities didn't change very much over the last 15 years, which points to overall stability over time and leads us to believe that there's probably the streams are fully seeded. So if you peel back the onion one more layer, things get more complicated. I'll tell you that on an individual stream basis, there were more variation between rounds, but the num with the number of nursery streams and the diversity of habitats that we have, the overall picture points towards stability. So it's kind of like a mutual fund, right? On, on any given round, some streams overperformed and some streams underperformed based on the average. And then they may have switched roles the second time round. So they, they averaged themselves out. So we're lucky to have this diversity of, of, of rearing habitats um, and not to have to put all of our money into bowing. We have a good idea of what lives where longitudinally within the streams and large scale density patterns, but our ability to understand the variation between streams is limited by the fact that we were only able to sample each stream three times over the last 15 years. So the map on the left is our, uh, was our existing sampling pattern where we have 96 sections listed in, with black triangles. And the map on the right is shows our new sampling regime that I'll talk about here next. So, Using the information that we gathered before, uh, we picked two to three sections per stream that best describe the fish assemblage within that stream. So by doing that, we reduced the number of sampling sections drastically. And moving forward, we're going to be able to sample the most important streams annually, which will be the black triangles on the right figure and the sections that we're going to sample, and continue to monitor the other streams on, on the same five-year rotation. So we'll be sampling less overall locations, but we'll be able to put together time series data so that we can start to understand the relationships between things like red counts, weather patterns and flow and juvenile abundance. And by doing that, we'll also still be able to keep an eye on other streams for, for large scale changes. So I'm gonna shift gears into some other work we've been doing with pit tagging. So pit tagging are a tag that are about the size of a grain of rice, uh, which allows us to mark both juvenile and adult fish. Uh, they're injected using a needle into the dorsal sinus of the back, 
which is basically the space between the fillets if you took them off underneath the dorsal fin. So it's not injected into the meat, but it's under the skin in that, that empty space between there. And they're basically the same, the same tag that you put in as if you put a chip into your dog. Uh, the, by doing this, this allows us to identify individual fish when we, when we recapture that fish and scan that fish uh, with a scanner. Um, up until now, we've been mostly been tagging bull trout, but we also have cutthroat trout and rainbows tagged in the lake. And the fish carry their tag throughout their lifetime. So once we, once we get a tag in them, we'll be able to follow them for the rest of their life. Um, a majority of the fish that we've marked have been adult bull trout that have been caught as bycatch on the net boat and released alive. But we also mark juveniles and the tributaries during our, our tributary surveys. So as of right now, we have about 3,000 bull trout tagged in the lake. So those tags are detected by an antenna of some sort, either antenna that we put in the stream or antenna that, a handheld antenna that if you have the fish in your hand, you can scan it with that. So at this point, we have six antennas, uh, in-stream in antennas installed around the lake. We have one in Gold Creek, uh, Granite Creek and Trestle Creek, and then three on the pack. The Granite and Trestle Creek antennas have been in in the system for about 10 years but the other the other ones are relatively new we installed gold a couple years ago and then the three on the pack we just installed this last summer so and then the other thing is the antennas are set up in pairs so we can determine the directionality of the fish so when they swim over the lower antenna and then the next antenna upstream uh, we'll know that that fish is moving upstream and vice versa when they swim over the upstream antenna and then the downstream antenna, we know they're leaving. And the, these antennas allow us to understand things like run timing, overall survival, uh, species of abundance, and habitat use. So there's a lot of, a lot of data we can get from them and we're, we're starting to collect that data um, more intensely now. So I wanted to give you an idea of what we we're finding. We knew we had to have an early run of bull trout in the Lightning Creek drainage because the, the lower river goes dry starting midsummer, and we suspected that there was probably an early run also in the Pack River drainage because the lower part of the Pack River gets pretty hot. Uh, but what we didn't know is that there was both an early and a late run portion of the run uh, bull trout run in other streams. So if you look at this figure, each line is the run timing over the last uh, 10 years or so for, for Trestle Creek. Um, the take home message here is that there was a peak in run timing in June and also a peak in September. Uh, we say, saw the same pattern in Granite Creek. Uh, it was a little bit overlapped a little bit more, but it is interesting information. And I think as, as we start to collect more pit information, there'll be more to come. Finally, I wanted to give just a short update on our education and enforcement program. As many of you know, we're lucky to have an extra officer on Lake Ponderay to conduct lake-specific enforcement and also to conduct educational outreach. Um, over the last year, we've combined uh, Dustin Mason's talents with the Regional Angler Education Program, um, and that helps him schedule his field trips and to widen his audience beyond just Bonner County. Uh, last year, for example, we were able to, or he was able to contact over a thousand people spreading the message of native salmonid conservation, especially with bull trout and Lake Ponderay management. So we're planning to continue working with our other partners like Trout Unlimited and Ponderay and the Ponderay Water Festival to keep up the good fight and, and keep that enforcement and, and his educational messages going. Now we'll switch back over to Andy for the last section of the presentation. Ultimately, much of the work we do is intended to benefit recreational angling. Creel surveys are the primary tool we use to evaluate the performance of recreational fisheries. These surveys allow us to estimate how much fishing takes place, what species anglers target, the catch rate and size of fish caught, and angler satisfaction. We can then make comparisons to previous surveys to understand changes over time. Creel surveys are expensive and time consuming to conduct, so we only do them periodically. We completed a 12 month creel survey on Lake Ponderay and the Ponderay River last year. The survey ran from mid March 2022 through mid March 2023. Boat counts were conducted by airplane during 208 different flights, and angler interviews took place at public boat ramps on 260 different days during the survey period. The colored dots on the map show the boat ramp locations where interviews were conducted. 
The survey design was randomized and followed standard creel survey methods. As with historical creel surveys, a limitation of this survey was that it did not capture shore-based angling effectively. However, most angling in the system is boat-based, so the influence on our estimates should be fairly minimal, particularly for the lake. If you were interviewed by one of our staff during the creel survey, thank you for taking the time to provide information. I'll jump right into results. First, I'll summarize results for the lake, followed by results for the Ponderay River. We estimated that anglers spent 188,000 hours fishing Lake Ponderay. This was similar to estimates from several other creel surveys conducted over the past 20 years, but we expected a higher estimate based on how well the fishery has been performing in recent years. I'll talk about a likely explanation for this shortly. This graph breaks out angler effort for each fish species. About 47% of the total effort targeted rainbow trout, followed by kokanee at 15% and smallmouth bass at 14%. Lake trout, walleye, and northern pike each made up about 3-5% to of the angler effort, and all other species had negligible effort. Now I'll drill down to show you how effort for each species compares to past surveys. The top graph shows kokanee effort, which was about 50,000 hours lower than in 2014. Although total kokanee abundance was higher in 2022, the number of adult kokanee was much lower than in 2014. As a result, kokanee fishing was difficult in 2022 and resulted in lower angler effort. It's common to see angler effort for kokanee cycle with adult fish abundance. In contrast, rainbow trout effort was slightly higher than in 2014 and was one of the highest estimates ever observed in a creel survey. Lake trout effort was the lowest observed since their initial population increase in the 1990s. This wasn't a surprise given that suppression has driven the population down over the years and fishing is now more difficult for most anglers. Walleye showed the opposite trend, increasing substantially from 2014. This also wasn't a surprise since the walleye population increased during that time and then became more popular with anglers. This figure shows the effort for bass, perch, and crappie in the lake. Historically, we lumped these species together during creel surveys since they weren't very common in the lake. To make comparisons to these older creel surveys, we also had to lump species in our current survey. Just recognize that almost all of the effort you see in this graph was for smallmouth bass. So effectively, this is the effort trend for smallmouth bass, which continues to steadily increase over time. This table shows the estimated number of fish caught and harvested for each species. Both smallmouth bass and kokanee offer high catch rates for anglers and together made up about 75% of all fish caught in the lake. However, harvest rate was very low for smallmouth bass and very high for kokanee. Lake trout and walleye also had very high harvest rates, which suggests the angler incentive program is motivating anglers to harvest these fish. Rainbow trout made up about 12% of the lake-wide catch. You'll also see that 39% of the rainbow trout that were caught were also harvested. This may seem high, but keep in mind the information Ryan shared from the tagging study earlier. Anglers only catch about 20% of the rainbow trout population in a given year, and harvest is less than 10% of the population. So the level of harvest that is occurring is low overall and not limiting overall abundance. The number of rainbow trout caught was high relative to past creel surveys and the highest since 2000. Additionally, the catch rate was almost twice as good as the 1978 to 2007 average at just over six hours per fish. No surprise here, but the size structure of rainbow trout caught by anglers was much larger than in 2014. This is simply a function of sustaining high kokanee density over the past decade, which has improved rainbow trout growth rates. Since there was much lower than normal fishing effort for kokanee, it makes sense that kokanee catch was very low. This just reinforces that 2022 was not a productive year to kokanee fish. Now I'll move into results from the Ponderay River. This was the first creel survey ever conducted on the river. Anglers fished 18,000 hours, most of which occurred from June through September. Water level management was likely a big reason for such seasonal angling, 
since access to the river is much more difficult when the lake is not at summer pool level. Bass made up 60% of angler effort and walleye another 20%. Effort was low for all other species in the river. When combined with the lake, angler hours targeting bass was about 37,000 hours. This was slightly more than kokanee at 28,000 hours, but far less than rainbow trout at 88,000 hours. This table shows the number of fish caught and harvested for all species in the river. In total, at least 15 different fish species were caught by anglers. Smallmouth bass alone made up nearly 75% of the fish caught. Largemouth bass can reach large sizes in the river and are desired by many bass anglers, but catch was about 90% lower than for smallmouth bass. Even though walleye made up 20% of the angler effort, they were only 2% of the total fish caught. This indicates that fishing was often challenging for anglers targeting walleye in the river. Finally, yellow perch were commonly caught despite few anglers specifically targeting them. When interviewing anglers on the lake and river, we asked to find out if they knew about the angler incentive program for lake trout and walleye. Awareness was highest among anglers targeting each species, but even general anglers were typically familiar with the program. We also learned that the likelihood of an angler turning in lake trout and walleye for the angler incentive program was exceptionally high. Only 10% of anglers were not at all or only slightly likely to turn in their walleye and lake trout. This tells us that the program is working to motivate harvest as intended. We also asked anglers how satisfied they were with their fishing trip that day. This was one of the most useful pieces of information from the Creel survey. For lake and river anglers combined, 1,700 responses were provided. Of those who responded, 85% reported moderate or higher satisfaction, with 61% saying they were very or extremely satisfied. Relative to other fisheries, these are very high scores that tell us our current management approach is providing mostly desirable fishing trips for anglers. We also broke out responses based on the species being targeted by anglers and learned that satisfaction scores were quite high across all species. Unfavorable ratings were relatively uncommon, with the exception of some walleye anglers. Interestingly, the satisfaction ratings for the three species we are managing against, lake trout, northern pike, and walleye, were quite good overall. This highlights that our management approach still offers angling opportunity even for these species that's desirable to many anglers, even when they exist at lower abundance. Finally, we asked all anglers to rate the level of crowding during their day of fishing. Overall, crowding was not perceived as a problem, with most anglers rating it as not at all crowded. We learned a lot from the Creel survey, and I'll quickly summarize a few of the take-home messages. For the lake, total effort was similar to other Creel estimates over the past two decades, but below what we expected. This was likely a result of having fewer adult kokanee in the lake than in previous years. In a better kokanee fishing year, we anticipate that effort would have been the highest since the early 1990s. Despite the poor kokanee fishing, rainbow trout and kokanee together still made up over 60% of total effort, as has been the case for the past 70 plus years of creel surveys. Changes are happening though, and the fishery was the most diverse it has ever been. More species were caught than ever before, and effort increased for species like smallmouth bass, walleye, and northern pike. For the Ponderé River, total effort was fairly low and focused during the summer. Bass and walleye made up most of the effort, and for both the lake and the river, angler incentive program awareness and participation was high and perception of crowding was low. Most importantly, angler satisfaction was very high for both the lake and the river. Since we've been talking about fishing on the Pondre River, I want to quickly highlight an access site improvement we completed in 2023. Although crowding was generally not a problem for most anglers, Morton Slough is a site that often has been crowded in recent years. Last summer, we expanded the parking lot to increase capacity and reconfigured the parking layout to allow easier parking and more efficient launching of boats. This project turned out great and we hope you enjoy using it. Now I'm going to quickly recap some of the things that we covered throughout the presentation 
and provide you with some take-home messages about the overall status of the fishery. Starting with Kokanee, we saw that the overall population abundance remained strong. However, we had adults that were rather small in 2023 and led to a fairly poor catch rate fishery. This was the second year in a row we had a subpar kokanee fishery, but for very different reasons. In 2022, when we did the creel survey, the number of adult kokanee was down from where we'd typically been. And in 2023, we saw the number of adults was higher, but their size was small enough that it made catchability difficult. So this is one of the challenges we have with adult kokanee in the system right now is that there's going to be some years where we can have better kokanee fishing and other years it's going to be challenged by the, either the number or the size of these adult fish. The good news is we continue to see good kokanee recruitment with a lot of fish in those younger age classes that are providing an abundant and consistent food source for predators. But in terms of the recreational kokanee fishery, it continues to cycle and that's going to depend on, like I said, the number and size of adult fish in a given year. For rainbow trout, we continued to see incredibly fast growth, producing a lot of big fish in the system. We also saw that recruitment is very good, continuing to see good numbers of younger age classes of rainbows, not only in the lake, but also within the tributaries. Harvest rates continue to be low at a population level and are not creating any issues for our ability to provide a trophy angling opportunity. In fact, the trophy fishery right now is continuing to be world-class, and I would argue that there are more large rainbows coming out of Lake Ponderay than anywhere else on Earth right now. For bull trout, Lake Ponderay continues to support a strong population. In fact, one of the strongest migratory bull trout populations in the country. We have seen some cyclical trends in this population though. Our red count in 2023 was quite low and causes us some level of concern, but fortunately we've seen some other lines of evidence that the population is doing better than our red count last year suggests. In lake survival of bull trout has increased over the past decade. We're also seeing high catch rates, in some of our other surveys within the lake and abundant stable juvenile densities within the tributaries that indicates we're having adequate number of spawners come back to provide good recruitment. We're also seeing fast growth of bull trout that are taking advantage of abundant kokanee in the lake and this is providing a unique catch and release fishing opportunity for large fish. West Slope cutthroat trout are another native fish that we're seeing is moderately abundant with a pretty stable population within the lake. And again, this is a catch and release fishing opportunity, but catch rates are quite good for folks that choose to pursue some cutthroat trout. For smallmouth bass, we continue to see a very abundant population with good size structure and fast growth right now, thanks in large part to kokanee that are supplementing their diet. Angler harvest continues to be low, especially for large fish. And that's allowing us to support a fishery that not only has high catch rates, but also is pr producing some exceptionally nice sized fish. For lake trout, the population remains at low density, indicating that our longstanding suppression program is working. We're yet to reach our management target of 2,500 adults, but when we do, we anticipate being able to ratchet back on the amount of suppression effort in the lake. We continue to have what's a low catch rate harvest and trophy fishery for lake trout, but there is opportunity out there that some anglers have continued to enjoy. For walleye, the population remains at generally low density, but of some concern, we saw an increase in our FWIN survey in 2023 relative to where we had been in 2020. This is being driven mostly by young fish, age zero and age two, and we're uncertain whether it's going to be easy to get ahead of these big age classes or if our existing suppression program is going to be challenged to kind of stay ahead of the growth we're seeing in this population. So more work to come on that. As we've talked about, walleye are opportunistic predators that cause us concerns, particularly now that we've documented that kokanee are the most important diet item to these fish in the system. Walleye are out there though and we're providing a uh, what's been a low catch rate, although an increasing catch rate fishery over the past year, and also the potential for some really trophy sized fish in the system. So walleye angling last year was as good as it's ever been, and we anticipate that 2024 is gonna offer more of the same. 
Northern pike are another species that we continue to see at low density, but are increasing in abundance. This is one of those species that we're trying to um, manage at lower density because we have concerns about predation impacts they could have in the system. Uh, the fish that are out there are growing fast, indicating they have plenty to eat. We also learned that they have pretty high catchability. So the tagging work we did this year showed that anglers are catching uh, roughly 50% of the pike in the population in a given year, and a high percentage of those are getting harvested, which is what we're hoping to see. Um, so the opportunity is out there for both harvest and trophy fishing opportunity, and we encourage anglers to take advantage of that. There's a variety of other spe fish species that anglers are catching in the system. Brown trout, yellow perch, black crappie, lake whitefish, largemouth bass are all contributing to the fishery, uh, providing that added value. And then finally, mice and shrimp. Um, we are continuing to see density of these shrimp creep back up closer to the what had been the long-term average before the collapse in uh, about 2012. This is something, as Ryan indicated, we're really tracking closely because it has implications for uh, the carrying capacity of kokanee in the system. Collectively, for species we manage for, our fishery objectives are largely being met. We have a diverse fishery with very high levels of angler satisfaction. We're also meeting our native fish conservation goals, particularly for bull trout and West Slope cutthroat trout. For species we manage against, lake trout, walleye, and northern pike, our management is generally proving effective, but we have a lot more work ahead of us to keep these populations in check. This is particularly the case for walleye, where we saw the population trend reverse in 2023, and with larger year classes of young walleye, we're going to be challenged to see if our current suppression program is going to be adequate to hold this population at a low density over the long term. We're also going to be looking at northern pike, doing some additional research to better understand uh, the impacts they may be having in the system and whether or not we can keep their population at a sufficiently low density. Despite the concerns we have about these three fish species, they are providing additional fishing opportunity in the system. And we also learned from the creel survey that anglers targeting these three species actually have fairly high angler satisfaction ratings. There's a common perception that because we're managing against these species that fishing for them is not good. But in fact, there's actually some very good opportunity for these fish and we anticipate that to continue into the future. The creel survey showed us that we currently have a lot of angler effort in the system. We estimated about 190,000 angler hours in the lake, nearly 20,000 angler hours on the Ponderay River, and several years ago we estimated about 12,000 angler hours on the Clark Fork River. So in a typical year, we can expect to see well over 200,000 angler hours in the system. And in a year with better kokanee fishing, I think we might actually be able to flirt with 300,000 angler hours in the system. Of course, sustaining a high effort popular fishery like this will continue to be challenging. There's a delicate balance in a large and increasingly complex lake like Lake Ponderé. We have to deal with a whole host of environmental factors, food web dynamics, a variety of other things that can make management challenging. But we currently recognize that sustaining the fishery primarily depends on managing the balance between predators and prey, and also we're at the mercy of mice and shrimp because we've documented that their abundance can have impacts on the carrying capacity of kokanee in the system. Another important factor in sustaining this fishery over time is continued public engagement and support from folks like you. One of the last things I'd like to share with you is that we're currently working on rewriting our statewide fish management plan. This is a plan that describes Idaho Fish and Game's management direction and is the guiding policy document for fishery activities over the next six years. It sets the overall framework for managing fishing in waters throughout the state, Pond Ray being one of those waters. We've had a public input period that's been open since February, and the deadline is coming up, so you have until April 12th to provide your input. We'll then use that input to help draft a new version of the plan, and we'll then bring that back out for public comment this summer. Here I've shown the web address where you can go 
and find more information about what the plan is, how to navigate the plan, and submit your comment. You can also scan the QR code here that'll take you directly to that website. So if you have any questions, please reach out to any of us, um, but I'd encourage you if you have thoughts, whether they're good or bad, about how we're managing the Lake Ponderay fishery or other waters throughout the state, uh, please take a few minutes and, and let us know what you think um, during this process. If you'd like to stay plugged in with our outreach efforts throughout the year, check out the Lake Ponderay Fisheries webpage located on the Fish and Game website. You can find this at the web address listed at the top of the screen. You can also scan this QR code on your smartphone and it'll take you to the website. This is a great place to periodically check and look for different news stories that we share with anglers throughout the year. Information from the Lake Ponderay Fisheries page is also posted to our Idaho Fish and Game Panhandle Region Facebook page. This is another way that you can find the information and the address is listed here, or again, scan the QR code to go directly to the page. That concludes the 2024 Lake Ponderay State of the Lake meeting. Thank you for watching.